Daily Detroit is brought to you by the community. Support our work at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. Hello and welcome to your Daily Detroit. I'm Jer Stays. For this Monday, October 19th, 2020, we're going to cover a number of stories to know around town, then finish it off with Fletcher Sharp talking sports. Let's get started as we do with the latest on the pandemic locally. In a report containing confirmed coronavirus cases since Saturday, the state is reporting more than 2,900 new cases and 21 deaths. That brings the pandemic totals up to more than 147,800 cases and 7,031 fatalities. Our statewide positive test rate is continuing to rise at 5.1%. According to Brown Health data, the entire Tri-County area is now considered an area of accelerated spread, with cases per 100,000 people increasing through the weekend. The virus is surging in all three counties over the last seven days, with Macomb remaining the highest, then Oakland, then Wayne. No county in the state is on track for containment right now, and many counties are on the tipping point of outbreak or there already. The Upper Peninsula is getting the brunt of this wave so far. The plus side is hospitalizations are not yet what they were in the spring, but they are rising. As a heads up, we're planning a special episode about contact tracing, health, and technology for the show later this week. The closure of the U.S.-Canada border, except for essential travel to keep COVID-19 contained, has been extended until November 21st. It's been closed since March, and it is reviewed every 30 days. Before the tweet by Canadian Emergency Minister Bill Blair, the border closing was set to expire in a few days. The closure isn't ironclad. Commercial traffic continues, and family members of Canadian citizens or permanent residents can cross into Canada. The catch is that they have to stay in the country for at least 15 days. On the other side of the river, the Windsor-Essex County area has been one of Canada's coronavirus hotspots through most of the pandemic. A couple of Michigan-based businesses were in national media over the weekend. First up, the blind pig in Ann Arbor was featured in a spot for presidential candidate Joe Biden. And it's the first time ever that the Beastie Boys license music for an ad. It focuses on an issue we've covered here at Daily Detroit, the decimating impact of the coronavirus on live music venues, businesses, and the artists. The blind pig has been open for a half century, and its co-owner, Joe Malkoon, had something to say about it. Here's a clip. We don't know how much longer we can survive not having any revenue. A lot of restaurants and bars that have been mainstays for years will not make it through this. We've also covered how the pandemic is shifting the economic playing field to larger corporations over small businesses who do not have the resources to weather not just the shutdown, but consumer behavior. A study by John Zogby Strategies released earlier this month said that three quarters of Americans only feel safe from the virus at home. And just a little under 8%, just 8% of Americans said that they feel safe at their favorite restaurant or cafe. Second, Saturday Night Live. The Farmington Hills-based Five Hour Energy made it into a skit. If you're not familiar, the shot-sized bottles claim to give you an energy boost with vitamins and caffeine and are sold in checkout lines and gas stations around the country. Called Five Hour Empathy, the sketch with Beck Bennett gives you the option to have a five-hour window into the systems of oppression and racism in our country. Bennett, who plays a stereotypical white dude, makes every excuse not to drink it. Here's a clip. So, are you going to try it? Uh, try, uh, it, what, the, the stuff? Yeah, the stuff I just told you about. You know it. <laughs> I mean... Uh, yeah. Well, do you want to do that now? You did say you wanted to understand what was making people so upset. I, I do. Wait, did you say it last five hours? That's right. Oh, yeah. I can't. I, uh... You're not scared, are you? Scared? <laughs> no. I'll put a link to the full thing in the show notes. One of Detroit's more popular neighborhoods is getting new housing, partnering with renowned art gallery owner George Nanomdi and Roderick Hardiman, CEO of Urge Development Group, Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan broke ground late last week on the OC Apartments at West End in Woodbridge. Out of the 30 apartments built, 15 will be reserved for affordable housing in a project estimated to cost $6.6 million. The apartment complex will serve as one of the major parts of the new West End Gallery District, 
that celebrates arts and culture in the area. Developers say that as a home to innovative entrepreneurs, this district will utilize creativity as a driver for sustainable and equitable development. The project is also the first to tap into Mayor Duggan's new $48 million Detroit Housing for the Future Fund for affordable housing. The 25,000-square-foot apartment building will be located at Grand River at Avery Street. The vast majority of the 30 apartments will be one-bedroom units with a sprinkling of studios and two bedrooms. On the ground floor, there will be 5,000 square feet of rentable commercial space. It's expected to be finished sometime in early 2022. The University of Michigan has been named one of the top 50 film schools in the nation. That's from the rap.com's college issue. Here's what they have to say, and I quote, The Department of Film, Television, and Media at the University of Michigan's College of Literature, Science, and the Arts has a world-class Orson Welles archive and sends alums to positions of power at Netflix, AMC, Comedy Central, Fox, Amazon, and Warner Brothers. Their pilots sell to HBO, AMC, and Hulu. They write for Blackish, House of Cards, and One Day at a Time. A quote from a decision maker at Hulu said that their friends who are coming out of U of M are working in L.A. or New York and are, quote, really successful, unquote. You know, we don't have a film industry here like we did for a few years. Most of those grads do have to hit the coast as Michigan has not been attracting the kinds of major budget films it once did under a controversial incentive program. That started in the wake of the recession in 2008 and ran until about 2012. Although competitive with what other states did, it was scaled back under former Governor Rick Snyder and eventually eliminated. There have been calls to bring something like it back, but so far it seems that they have not gotten a ton of traction. U of M was the only Michigan school in the Raps.com's list. The top three were NYU, USC, and the AFI Conservatory took the top spot. A downtown Royal Oak mainstay, Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle, is reopening Thursday, November 5th. The capacity will be limited to 100 people and tables to four folks. And it'll be asked that people need to stay six feet apart. Masks need to be on when you're not at the table. Having attended a few shows there in the past, this seems kind of doable. There's enough space there. The first act will be Nick Griffin, followed by John Heffron and Joe DeVito in coming weeks. Well, now that Matt Stafford, Lions quarterback, has had a touchdown pass against every team in the NFL but the Detroit Lions, the Lions have a win. It's amazing. And of course, to talk about it, Fletcher Sharp. Good to talk to you, man. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's dive into this. It was a wide win. There was definitely points between the teams, but it seems like the overall feeling is that Although a win's a win, this this isn't necessarily the most impressive of feats. This is literally the only franchise that's almost as hapless as the Lions, so it's not really that big of an accomplishment. Like, I know a win is a win, as you said, but, like, as Brock Howard, a uh, former quarterback and commentator for the game, said, there was a point where, like, even though the Lions were up significantly, everyone was still like, all right, like, how are they going to lose this game? When an out-of-towner comes in and says that, like, oh, wow, like, how are they going to mess this game? Like, you know, like, it's, it's high anxiety. So, yes, they beat the Jaguars. Yes, they had a 100-yard rusher for the, the eighth time in Matt Stafford's career, which is, like, really crazy. Uh, I saw a stat where he's improved to 7-1 and one when he has someone rush for 100 yards, which means in, like, the 12 years he's been here, uh, he's had, like, maybe five guys do it. Ugh. If I had to sit down and think, I can name all of them. I'm fairly certain James Stewart's probably one. Adrian Peterson came close. Yeah, you know what? Never mind. I can't name them all. But the point is, is the fact that, like, we've had so many running backs between now and then, and, like, only eight times over 100 yards. Well, and that's just, if you don't have support, it doesn't matter what kind of quarterback you got. Although there is that argument that a good quarterback will take rather average folks and kind of elevate them. That's true. And I'm not trying to say anything about Stafford because I think he's been pretty good. I don't think he's been as elite as people make him out to be. Um, a lot of people don't seem to realize a lot of his passing numbers are because his team's down by two to three touchdowns. And yes, eventually, like, yeah, they'll go and score a bunch. But the problem is, is eventually your offense just gets worn down. And yes, if you're chasing four touchdowns almost every game, you'll score three sometimes, but you won't score that fourth because you're exhausted. Or you'll score that fourth and then give up like some backbreaking touchdown that's really dumb. You know, I applaud them. I know Lions fans are happy with just a win for right now. 
but I'm a little bit annoyed because it gives Matt Patricia an excuse to keep his job for another game. If they lost to the Jaguars, it was very certain that he was not going to be on the flight back, not be the coach. So a win helps him stay in the seat, but like I don't see him finishing the year. Really? You don't think that's a possibility? Unless they can play the Jaguars like four more times. All right. All right. I mean, I'm always kind of nervous with these midseason firings. It seems like the Lions over the years, the Ford family has been rather loyal, at least till the end of the season. Well, until when they've not been, right? Exactly. Uh, well, with that in the books, what are you uh, looking forward to head to next week with the Lions? Honestly, I don't know. I want to see if they can keep this run game going. They finally got Swift the ball in between the tackles, which was nice to see. I know he's kind of brought in to be the third down back. I know I was very critical of him the first week, as everyone was, when he dropped that game-winning touchdown in the end zone, especially because that's what he was supposed to be there to do. But they kind of gave him a chance to actually shine in between the tackles, which is great for him. Kind of decent for Adrian Peterson. Really bad for Carryon Johnson because they drafted a second round running back after drafting you a second round running back. And he's right now getting more touches than you are and shining. So might not be a good look for him going forward. And I talked to someone about it who I played football with in high school. And he's like, yeah, you got to keep as many running backs as you can, because if someone gets hurt, you know, you need to use somebody. But like. I understand you're supposed to be planning for injury, but you shouldn't be planning for injury like that. I want to see if they can continue to balance the run in the pass. When the Lions balance the run in the pass, throughout all the history of Detroit Lions, when they balance the run in the pass, they become a good team. Or if they just end up running the ball a lot, they end up winning games more so than losing games. They get worrisome when they start throwing the ball around a lot because that typically means like they're chasing something enough to where they can't even like fake a run anymore. And if you can at least balance the run in the pass, Matthew Stafford should have more avenues to throw, should not have as many interceptions, albeit there was a time against Jacksonville where he threw the ball into a defensive lineman's hands who then caught it and brought it down. So there's always a chance for that to happen. But if you can balance the run in the pass, maybe like 25 runs, 35 passes or something like that, you typically give your team a chance to win. Well, here's something we didn't think we'd be talking about earlier this year, but College football, it's a thing. Uh, Michigan State is playing Rutgers in East Lansing on noon on Saturday. Uh, what are your thoughts on that one? I don't think they should be doing it, but people are really keen to get college football back. So, you know, they get their wish. Uh, Rutgers historically is a bad team. Uh, Michigan State's coming off of like losing a fair amount of players they need. They return some weapons, but they currently have a musical chair situation for quarterbacks. So we're hoping that they can finally nail someone to have someone start consistently because the quarterbacks they do have are decently young and will be there for more than another year. So it makes sense to have some guys stick there and kind of ride it out. They should win that game. Rutgers is just not good since moving to the big 10 they've really not had a good football team at all they were kind of moved to the big 10 for their basketball program and their basketball program kind of even isn't doing that great either so like i don't really know what the point of them being here is at this point <laughs> well let's move to michigan at minnesota 7 p.m on saturday it's a situation where we're getting into the uh sunset seasons of jim harbaugh's contract there's a lot of things kind of up in the air with Michigan. Michigan has not performed at the level that I think people were hoping a couple of years ago. I don't know if they're doing the whole bowl season where everyone's going to a bowl game or if it's just the playoffs, given COVID being a thing. But like if they are doing the big bowl season where like you can go to a big bowl that maybe not might not be a playoff bowl, Jim Harbaugh has to do that. Jim Harbaugh really needs to qualify for the playoffs, to be quite honest. But like that's a pipe dream because Michigan's not built to do that but then if they don't go there they need to go to a big time bowl that's like around new year's day they don't need to go to a bowl that's you know the quench gum <laughs> the five hour energy bowl or something they need to go to a bowl sponsored by tostitos or the orange bowl or something like that they, they need to go to a bowl like that if they do not get to something like that then like he probably should be gone with as much fireworks as he came in with. I'm a former professional coach played at Michigan. I did this with the 49ers. I got to the Super Bowl, didn't win, but I got there, did this other stuff. I was innovative with my defense. Then to get here and just regress totally, especially after what he did with Stanford before he went to the pros, like Stanford had less talent and most of those teams and most of Michigan teams have now. And yet they still cannot produce anywhere near those numbers. Stanford was putting up. At some point, it's the players. Yes, like you don't have your players. He has his players now. If he's not winning games, he's supposed to be winning games. It's you. Like the problem is you as a coach. And like it's going to stink for those players who he's recruiting to come in. But like I don't think you should be able to keep your job, get paid that much and do a mediocre job. Like I don't think that's fair to the kids you're putting out there for because they're expected to go out there and win and you're not giving them all the tools to win. This season's going to be kind of pivotal because 
it's not a good situation to have your head coach coach on the last year of a contract. Either he's going to get an extension or he's going to get the, you know, kind of get the rug pulled up. What about this game specifically with Minnesota? Minnesota is a team on the rise, so this will be a pretty tough match for them. I see Michigan maybe eking it out at the end, but also I see them losing by 15. Ouch. It's either they're going to like kind of grind it out, grind it out, get a win, maybe get another win, try to like sneak into the rankings some sort. But like otherwise, I see them either like winning late or I see Minnesota just establishing the run game early and often. Mm, Good to know. All right. Well, Fletcher Sharp, St. FDW on Twitter. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for having me. All right, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got thoughts, send me an email, jarrettdailydetroit.com. If you've got other thoughts, you can leave a voicemail, 313-789-3211. I'm Jarrett Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll get through all this together. Talk tomorrow.